The Joyful Noise Radio Hour.
chocolate to your fat but happy at the apogee of life Fat but happy at the apogee of life Does the birthday boy have any comments to make to everybody? No. I mean, is he happy? Still frowning like a founding father on a dollar. Vitriol melts down to the tonic no. matched with panic language. No, it takes more damage from the rash caused by the man who I was born choked in a shroud of thick smoke. I was born under a cataract from a cataract. Was born swimming in that milky aura. Yeah, I was born in that old stretched out bursac man. But I was born in spring, the year Jupiter got its ring. I was born inflamed, shot face first out the cock thigh of a hurricane. And today, still some of that storm surrounds me. From my frame I've been shaking off a shadow All my life I've been shaking off a shadow All my life oh, I may be pink When I come out my skin Come out on side oh yeah Yeah, I was born in spring I know it in kerosene I might yet take flame
What, you're trying to record this shit? You got to turn your camera on, too. There we go. All right. So for those who don't know, this is Yoni Wolf, who is... I never tell you this because we're friends and I don't want to make it awkward, but I'm going to now. You are one of my favorite artists, you know, period. He's not even drunk right now. He's not even drunk right now. Not yet. <laughs> oh, I only tell you that when I'm drunk, probably. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. You're one of my favorite label heads. Oh, good. Good. Hey. And uh, we started working together a while ago, but it was a uh, it was a really gradual sort of transition into like fully working together. I would say, right? Can, can you? Because I I don't even remember the history other than I feel like I must have had something on a comp or something, and then we ended up doing golden tickets after that. Yeah. Right? So I think it was the Flexi series. Okay. I think I asked you to be on the Flexi series. This is a thing we were doing, like a monthly single series that we did for five years, starting in 2012, I believe. I think that was the first time we worked together, and it was a song called Bangs, I remember. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. And that was just like a one-off little thing, because that Flexi series was all about just me asking my favorite bands to... <laughs> if they had any B-sides that hadn't been released before, and we would put them right. out and, you know, it'd be this one-time pressing and never any digital and stuff. It ended up being the start of a relationship with quite a few artists, um, nice. yourself included. And so I think after that, we, we did Golden Tickets. So Golden Tickets is a pretty interesting concept. Do you want to describe what that was? Yeah, it's an interesting period of why history. It, it was like um, we would basically take a fan, like a Y fan, and then, you know, I would like write a song for them, like kind of like their theme song, almost <laughs> their personal anthem. And how did you get the fan information? Like, did people submit themselves or was it truly like a cyber stalking your fans type of thing? It started as like a way to boost sales on our like web store because we started a web store like, all right, how are we going to get people to want to buy stuff from here? So we were like, all right, like golden ticket, like out of each person that buys anything from the web store for a particular month, you know, February, for example, you know, like one, one person is chosen at random and uh, we actually like cut up each name and put it in a hat and pick it. Uh, and then that person got their, you know, the song written about them. And then you would like Google that person's name and try yeah. to find out information about them like you wouldn't let them supply the info no they wouldn't know that the song yeah. is being oh okay so when when was the first time they would hear it uh i think when everyone else would hear it as far as i know yeah so basically a y fan would come to your web store buy an album and unbeknownst to them you had written a song about them and it just showed up one day and they're like what the fuck yeah it would show up in their in their inbox you know <laughs> cuckoo cooper conley courier called murmurer on ok cupid dude's a constant worrier and weren't it for his nervous nature he'd by now be engaged to the lovely blonde marae But instead, he'll make a film about their breakup. That's how broken up he feels. He's got lots to learn and so much time to make up. They were going on five years. Yeah, he controls the camera, but he could not control his fear. So we lost what was dear And then after that We started to auction them off For charities uh, For a few of them Oh like a song Like you would write a song for them yeah, yeah, uh, And the money would go to charity Yeah Yeah we'd say whoever bids the most Gets mm -hmm. a song about them and, and the money goes to charity Basically yeah 
And so what ended up on that EP was all of those songs or? All the ones from that like year or whatever. Yeah. And then there are about 20 others from wow. uh, the tour that we did uh, where every single day, this was crazy. Oh, I remember that. Yes. Okay. okay. This was like, I think it was 2013, 2014. Every single day on the tour, uh, we would get into the van and we would choose one person from ticket sales for that show that night. And, you know, <laughs> like I would, would like scroll through the ticket sales and look through everybody's socials. And we would kind of, that one wasn't as random. We would pick someone that we knew had some social media that we could look through because, you know, I didn't have time to like get too deep in stalking. Right. So we'd pick somebody in the van. I would sit there writing the song, you know, some melody ideas into my voice memos. And then uh, they would drop me off at the hotel. I would sit down with a little Casio, write, uh, write the song. While they set up, Brent would set up all the you know mics and everything like that. I would come back for sound check with the song in hand, and you know play it for the band, and they would learn it. And then that night, we would call up one person from the audience, you know, be like, "Hey, like you know, is so and so here in the audience?" Bring them up on stage. They had no idea what was going on. Like you're the golden, you're the golden ticket winner. And we would sing a song to them with like very private shit, you know, <laughs> their social media uh, in there and, and just look, watch their reaction. <laughs> oh my God. It's such a funny and specific and kind of like frightening crowd participation tactic. For a lot of people getting up on stage, it's like, uh, it's like getting called out by the teacher or something. Right. You know? There were definitely some people that didn't want to do it. And one guy didn't show up to the show. Uh, <laughs> I think we sang his song nonetheless. But uh, he, yeah, one guy wasn't there, I remember, when we called him. Or he just, he dodged us. That's also right. a problem. Right. Which is probably what I would have done. Yeah. Fucking, in retrospect, it's awful. Like, I never, you know, I don't want to be that person. <laughs> I don't know if you were sort of viewing that Golden Tickets release as a trial period or whatever but i certainly was i can't remember but yeah probably so i just knew i really wanted to work with you guys and i was like we can prove to them that we're a real label <laughs> by doing this well and then i think after that was the yoni and getty record yeah, yeah. that yoni and getty record uh, oh, we'll say as well what's that we did oh divorce say yeah it was a one-off sort of project of you and your ex anna yeah. stewart yeah. I remember you being like, look, we don't want to tour this. If you want to release it, that's fine, but it needs to be like properly scaled. Right, right, right. Yeah, I I, I think uh it's but it's cool though. It's a great record, man. Yeah, and it's one of those that yeah more people need to appreciate. Yeah, it's you know, it's it, it should be maybe low key, but but uh yeah, I think it's a cool thing uh that we did. You know, it, it was maybe seven years you know it took us to make it just kind of like on and off you know hmm. depending on how we got along we had some some troubled years and some good years did you start that project before or after you broke up after what yeah. was that like uh it was, like, it was weird it was yeah i remember it being like a weird emotional roller coaster for sure did you want to do that collaborative project with her as a way to explore the weirdnesses in your relationship or did you want to do it just because you thought she was a great singer or, or... i probably wanted to do it to be around her and to win her heart back that's oh, you know, like, that's probably what i was thinking at the time um but you know then then my sort of obsessive nature about writing and songs and recording kicked in at some point it was like gosh this is stuff we need to like keep doing this to finish it up you know um yeah yeah but i don't know that's that was probably like the initial you know i i remember her saying that like she was gonna she was gonna like write songs with her current boyfriend i mean current as of you know 2005 or whatever 
Mm -hmm. Uh, And I was like, you know, I was like, you guys really going to do it? She's like, yeah. You know, I was like, we should do it. And she's like, okay. You know, it was kind of (laughs) like, kind of poached. I remember poaching the idea. (laughs) And then next was the Yoni and Getty project, which I would say that was the first one where you and I collaborated more on a creative level. Yeah. You know, like when you guys were doing that project, you weren't sure what to call it. You know, it's going to be a new band. It's going to be a Serengeti record. It's going to be a solo Yoni record or whatever. Like, I don't know. I mean, not to say that I had a huge hand in it or anything, but I remember, you know, weighing in on sequence questions and shit like that. For sure. Yeah. And that record, that's the one where I feel like you and I sort of learned how to work together, you know? Yeah. And it made us both comfortable to do the next proper while. <laughs> Totally. Yeah, I thought that one went really well. And I, I, I have a very, very large space in my heart for that album. I think that's Yeah, really, dude. I think in retrospect, you know, and I don't think we could have known this back then because, like, the, the streaming services were a little different and stuff. Mm-hmm. In retrospect, I sort of think if we would have just called it, like, Serengeti and Y or something like that. Yeah. It would have done better just for just for people being able to find it you know well, what I mean? that probably would have been the tactic now yeah mm-hmm. but i actually think that record is better off called yoni and getty <laughs> paid vacation for two, 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 two three, 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 three days and two nights of picturesque beauty in your future. Congratulations. You know, uh, I keep my credit scores well above 765. Uh, it's good to know. No. No. Sir, it's a trip of a lifetime provided you sit in on a short presentation on the opportunity to own a timeshare in that resort. Been, like applying for new cars. The city bank. Um, the M- the M- okay, well, you, that, well, you, that, that's great. great. Uh, I gotta go. It has been a cold autumn, December In our queen bed, I still sleep on my side You went on a cruise to the Bahamas The steps are full of glass, I still Oh, 
You know, we felt like, me and Dave, just felt like, because we talked about calling it Serengeti and Wire, Wire and Serengeti, but it felt too, like, official. Yeah. We, we wanted the album to feel like just this low-key hang, you know, like, hey, it's, you know, it's, it's just Yoni and Getty, it's me and Dave, like, you know, like, it just... Yeah that's kind of the vibe that we were going for with the, with the, with naming it, you know, I think it's perfect, man. I remember when you told me that, yeah, like, I think you had other band names you were considering too, if I recall. Yeah, we did have band names. I don't remember what they were, but I know we did, we were throwing around band names and then we were like, ah, you know, I was probably encouraging you guys to do it as Serengeti and Yoni Wolf or something like that. But, uh, I remember when you told me Yoni and Getty as a band name, I'm like, Fucking perfect, man. Like, perfect. <laughs> After that Yoni and Getty record, we did Moline. And Moline, um, the cover of that is from your wall in there, huh? Yeah, I can show you that. Yeah, there it is. That's what the cover of Moline came from. That was, that was dug out. So the guys that were working on my house when I first bought it found that underneath layers and layers of wallpaper and plaster. And that's the original wallpaper from 1889. Oh, fuck yeah. And they asked me there, you want to keep that? I was like, yeah, super cool. So we did. And you immortalized it by making it the cover of a Y record. That's right. But then after that, I think we reissued alopecia. Alopecia in particular is like an undergraduate college experience that everyone has to go through. I don't want to call it juvenile, but there's like a, a certain angst and searching that my music has you know even newer stuff maybe that is really like a college kid thing yeah <laughs> you know like i've yeah. never grown out of that mindset or something yeah um, one of the most fucked up lyrics on alopecia talking about jerking off in an art museum john till my dick hurts you know like that kind of shit yeah i That's mean stuff that people like probably didn't put on records before. <laughs> yeah, that sort of thing. I, I did feel like, you know, all these things that I have deep shame about, you know, why not just expose them about myself? Because like all this stuff is just sort of societal norms anyway, you know, when, in terms of what, what we feel free to talk about and not talk about, we all do weird shit. Like, yeah. you know, and I started to sort of realize that or realize that I just wanted to, I didn't want to carry those feelings myself. And so, right. Hey, like, here's me. This is what, this is, this is me, you know? And it's not that all that stuff is, is, uh, is autobiographical. Cause a lot, a lot of that stuff, you know, if you're talking about alopecia, a great deal of that stuff is just writing, you know, I'm just writing fiction, but, with an emotional truth, I feel like, you know, mm. that, I, that, you know, it's still, the album still ends up being pretty autobiographical in terms of just its feeling, I think, of me at that age, you know, at like in my late twenties, you know. Yeah, letting go of that psychological weight. Yeah. Through artistry, through like projecting it into the world. Yeah. That's, that's fucking brave, dude. This is stuff that, like, I don't think you can do anymore. That's the thing. And I think that's what people respond to about alopecia is, like, you know, that was in a pre, I don't want to say Me Too era, but, like, you know, we've... we've Pre-cancel culture era. Yeah, we're clamping down more in a cancel culture. You know, we're sort of clamping down on what we feel free to open up about now, which, you know, to some extent, there, there are good things about that, um, you know, in yeah. terms of... Like we're learning how to not be fucking assholes to each other. Sure. Sure. There's some good stuff about that, but there's all, it also goes too far really, really quickly. Yeah. I mean, and also there's a whole, you know, 48% of this country 
that could give a fuck and is saying all the, the nasty shit. Yeah. Always said. But uh yeah, I don't know. I I I do feel like that was a time when, you know, I felt I felt like I wanted to push on that a bit and just say what was honest because it's honest, you know. Do you feel like when you're writing songs now that it has a uh that you're worried about that like are are you concerned when you're writing lyrics about how they'll be perceived i think that's just naturally just the the weight of the culture is a part of me you know and everyone else i mean you know this was a time during alopecia where you had eminem you know and people like that being being really sort of like provocative in a different way and i felt like and i feel like i was influenced by him i would li i listened to him when i would run you know he was a great rapper and i i would sort of get inspiration from that I'm like man like yeah but like i wanted to be open and and sort of like push on boundaries in a more personal humane and intimate way trying to exercise some of that shame and just trying to relate to other people you know instead of putting people away i feel like he he kind of was pushing people away and then would have to do stunts like hold hands with elton john at the grammys or something right right walk walk things back that were not cool i was trying to penetrate the deep cynical mindset of the hipster class at that time which i was part of you know and so i was talking about all these things that we all you know the fixed gear bikes and the, you know all the all the different the whole foods and the you know all the things that were within that culture uh but i was trying to eschew the not caring you know in favor of like being sad on maine as yeah, they like personal yeah. yeah like hey like this is where i'm at like this yeah. is like fuck your fuck your cool you yeah. know the cool shit like and it ended up and then it, i ended up being like one of the pied pipers of the hipster thing with that <laughs> and it was accepted by the hipsters you know what yeah. i mean you no know, it goes i, I guess so sick of that thing i was so sick of that like yo we're so fucking cool we don't have feelings and you know look at us like pbr you know even though we're privileged kids kind of thing but yeah somehow it caught on i don't know yeah how do you feel about it now like singing lyrics like you know those kind of gnarly lyrics <laughs> no i i struggled doing the, those songs live for a long time uh but i don't know i you know at this point i don't know what i would do live i can't even imagine what I would perform. I like, I feel that there's a break between pre pandemic and, you know, I almost feel like it's like you have to just kind of start over. Mm -hmm. Like, this is like the new what I'm doing now. I, like, I can't imagine like singing old songs. Not to say that I wouldn't and I won't because I might, mm -hmm. but it's hard to really imagine that. You know, we've all been through so much change it feels strange to go back to that and also just playing like i can't imagine going back to 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 touring and playing shows in the way that we did in the before times you know yeah i can't really fathom that and i you know i see bands going out and playing these clubs that i've played before and i'm just like so crazy that people are getting back to it and i just don't really even want to do that you know it's like i do have a hankering sometimes to tour definitely have a hankering to travel i haven't traveled like that mm. i think i went to indianapolis twice to visit you guys that's like literally that's it i went to columbus once to catch uh sylvanesso but that's literally the only places i've been wow. since 2020. so i don't know i i definitely have a hankering for that but i don't want to do the same kind of touring you know, I, I I can see doing like house shows or like some like super small like intimate shit. Mm -hmm. um, I think that would be fun. I can't really imagine going back to playing like big club, big like rock clubs. You know, mm -hmm. 
like it's hard for me for me to imagine that people are still listening to my music like i i just feel so disconnected in a way other than and we'll talk about this later i'm sure the aec you know which mm. has been a different kind of connection and it's very cool yeah i mean that's a good segue into the artist enabler club it started out as an experiment that we did with Lou Barlow last year, or I guess maybe it was two years ago when we started it at this point. And it is essentially a way for fans of a particular artist to sign up and have special access to the recording process of that artist and not only get the digital, but you can sign up to get monthly physical lathe cuts that are made by hand here at Joyful Noise. and. We did this with Lou Barlow first, and it worked out really well and resulted in his album, Reason to Live. And when that ended, I, uh, I actually, I think I talked to you about it before the Lou thing even happened. I think we've been talking about this for a while, but yeah, it felt like this idea of the club being a sustainer of the process was something that I felt like was specifically suited for you. You're essentially, your ass is sort of on the line to write, to write and record one song per month. Yeah, two songs. I mean, write one and record two. Yeah. I make a, a cover song every month. So yeah, it's it's been a lot, but it's good. It it keeps me going, not only financially, because, you know, people, people like pay for the subscription, uh, which is great, but also psychologically, it's like... Mm -hmm. It gives me deadlines knowing that other humans are going to hear it. Mm -hmm. I can sort of get stuck on one thing for like, I can work on one song for six months, you know. You are a guy that really needs deadlines because you are kind of a perfectionist. Yes. You're an amazing producer. And so you can just endlessly improve anything you're working on. There's some truth to that. Yeah, there's some truth. So it's, it's, it's good to keep keep things moving and knowing that, I'm making demos, you know, it sort of gives me an out psychologically to know that, okay, this isn't like the finished thing. I can turn this in now, you know, these, you know, limited amount of people that subscribe mm -hmm. to this thing will hear it. And I can, if I want to next month, I can always put an amended version of it, you know, and eventually it'll change drastically have other people involved see what it turns into you know yeah it's been cool man and it funds the process right which is super important especially in a non-touring ecosystem yeah. it enables me to to survive without touring basically yeah. yeah now let's talk about the albums you've produced other than the ones that you are an artist on like divorcee and all the Y records and Yoni and Getty, you produced the first Ophelia's record. Um, Ophelia's record. Or, sorry, the second Ophelia's record. The yeah. first one you brought to the label through the White Label series. Yes. You I were did. curator on the first, I think it was the first year that we did the White Label. And so you introduced us to the Ophelia's through the White Label series. And then, as I recall, they sent us demos of their next record. And I think I basically sent them to you and said, we'll release this if you produce it. <laughs> yeah, that's basically what happened. Yeah. <laughs> and you made that record just something really special, you know? I mean, I can't, I certainly cannot take all the credit for that. They're great songs. They are. Uh, but that band is, was in their infancy. And at least from my perspective, you took that record from like a bunch of standalone songs and you made it an arc. The, the arc of a really incredible record. Well, thank you. I, you know, I was glad to be a part of the process. Like it was, it was a tough process, you know, inter interpersonally, it was kind of tough, but I definitely think the record is fantastic. And I think, you know, something that I've learned over the years is sometimes a difficult process and different, like, different opinions pushing on each other can yield really cool results. There was some magic that happened in the discomfort. Mm -hmm. That can be the case. Now, there are other things that I've worked on that have been super harmonious and are also good. So it doesn't always have to take right. that. 
mistake, but sometimes if different people do have different ways of listening, you know, uh, different different opinions about what what good music is, you know, it can yield a really cool cool result. Yeah. I feel that way working even with my brother on stuff. I mean, you know, some stuff we do is harmonious, but there's pushback on from mm -hmm. both sides, you know, at times on some of the stuff too. And I think that what's it been like working with a family member? What's it been like working with Josiah for so long? Oh, it's really wonderful. You know, um, something that I've learned though about myself is that being a little brother, I can fall into that role of needing that sort of supervision or, or hand holding at time. Mm -hmm. You know, over the years, I've had friends that end up being that sort of big brother character mm -hmm. in my life. And, um, not always unhealthy. Sometimes it's a good, it's a good match, you know, and I've also been that maybe that elder character for other people at times as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I guess it, it goes both ways, but, um, it, you know, by and large, uh, it, it has been really wonderful. Um, when did you first collaborate? We first collaborated on my old band cloud dead. So we had one track. I mean, it was like a six minute track that had like four songs in it, basically, you know, like a chunk. This is where I got the idea for how to put AOK Ohio together, you know, mm. like in chunks like that. That was sort of originally like our, our ethos for Cloud Dead, the first album. Um, so we made a chunk together in, in our old childhood bedroom. I, I mean, didn't realize you were that young when you were in Cloud Dead. Yeah, you yeah. Like nineteen. Yeah, Cloud Dead. I was yeah nineteen or twenty. Wow. Yeah. So he he moved to New York. He was doing jazz, like trying to become a jazz drummer in New York. Basically, um, that's where he met Mike Sabino. Mike Sabino yeah. was, was an upright bass player from Tall Tall Trees, who he is now playing with. That's right. Um, like I just saw them at our venue next door uh, a couple months ago. The venue is called Healer, and uh, it was fucking incredible, man. I just, it's so great to see both those guys playing together. And I know they go way, way, way back, but like, well, you know, they're, they're real musicians, trained musicians, can kind of go on the fly. You know, I'm not like that. Uh, unfortunately, I'd like to be, but I'm more of a, you know, I have to write stuff and work it out and figure it out and, whatever to play live and we're her practice a lot. And, you know, those type of guys can just, I mean, boom, right off the top. Right. Uh, but yeah. So he moved to New York. I moved to California. I sent him this finished uh, album that I made called reaching quiet and uh, sent that to Josiah and he flipped out, you know, and he's like, man, I want to be a part of this. And I was like, well, come on then. And he, he moved out to California. So that's and kind this of is, This is right when you were starting Anticon too? Yeah. Did Cloud Dead originally come out on Anticon? No. Cloud Dead came out on a little label called Mush. That was a Cincinnati label and then moved to LA at some point. Um, and ended up really giving me a distaste for record labels um, over time. Just because it, it was just you know, one of these typical stories where we didn't get paid and we, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. But, but they, um, you know, they weren't all bullshit. There was, you know, the guy had taste and was trying to do something. I guess, I don't know what he was doing with the money, but they, um, ended up. Yeah. He's probably reinvesting it in other records. Yeah, like, probably. Probably. That's what happens way too often with, yeah startup labels is they don't have the infrastructure in place for accounting exactly and, and so it's just too much expenses are too high for everything so everything rolls over to the next yeah, so it's robbing peter to pay paul forever artists yeah. fucked. but anyway they licensed to a label called big data uh which was a uh the hip-hop name of ninja tune in hmm. hey so we ended up really blowing up in the uk hmm. um, with cloud dead anyway josiah moved out to the bay and, uh, you know, and started working on the Y stuff with me.
That's awesome. And that's right around the time that you became a founder in this new label, Anticon. Yeah. Which I would say Anticon was trailblazing, you know? Yeah, for a certain thing. It definitely it definitely was for a certain a certain like kind of uh you know underground experimental hip hop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Big time. Yeah. Even though you weren't, you know, involved in like day to day stuff, you were a founding partner in this pretty well known sort of foundational label in the early aughts. Yeah. I I never I never ran the label, but I definitely had an inside look and used to, you know, I used to write the one sheets for a few years for everybody. And I used to put people's albums together, like sequence people's albums occasionally. Oh yeah. Um, mix, mix people's albums sometimes, um, you know, do little co-production co or production for people, you know, just, just be part of the, part of the goings on, you know, just, just, mm -hmm. just, just inside the thing, um, trying to make the label do well. Do you feel like Anticon was more tied to a specific time and place? We tried to grow, you know, we tried to grow and develop, um, and hence signing acts, you know, artists like, like Sunlux, uh, Baths, um, you know, lots of other artists who weren't like the founders. Mm -hmm. The initial idea was like it's like a co-op, right? Mm -hmm. Like owned by the people that put the that put their music out on the label. That was kind of the initial idea, and then we started to sort of branch out and say, okay, well, you know, there's lots of other great stuff out here, and you know, we became the owners became A and R's essentially. Mm -hmm. So I would bring projects. That's why it's like natural for me, and I'm constantly bringing stuff to you, like the Ophelias or um i think that's the only one you've you've actually accepted but i you know i i'm always sending you stuff because it's just a natural thing for me to be like yeah. be an artist i'm like okay this could do well yeah it's natural for a lot of artists i think to try to prop up good art that they see yeah that's what we became as the owners uh as well as still releasing our music um we would do that and yeah but i mean eventually the label folded just because of uh that that same shit actually that happened with mush you know where it was like you know artists money was getting rolled over into the next thing and you know expenses and bank accounts getting emptied out just that way and not you know you can't yeah. continue like that so we ended up folding sadly but um yeah we had some good years and released some some great music yeah it's very easy to fall into that trap yeah. Like in this business, you know, you have to really put a lot of your resources towards accounting, which is it doesn't come naturally to artistically minded people. Not sexy, They're, not sexy, but you, but it, it's necessary for. It's absolutely, it's so necessary. I think in most cases, it's not ill will or or people being shysty or whatever. It's just people letting like getting a little bit of success and not having the infrastructure and letting it get out of control and then they can't pay anybody. Right. Yeah. You have to like really stay on top of it and yeah. like, which I'm not good at for my personal money, really, you know, just, like, <laughs> as, as something comes in, yeah. constantly remarking everything. And yeah, I can and see it, that does not come naturally to me at all. Advice for young labels out there. If you start getting successful before you sign a new band, before you reinvest in the label, invest in some fucking accounting infrastructure. And pay everybody out. And yeah. pay everybody out immediately. Do yeah. not rob Peter to pay Paul. Exactly. Let's talk about your upbringing with Josiah, not necessarily just with Josiah, but your upbringing is a unique one, at least in my mind, because you were raised Messianic Jew, which is one of the more marginalized groups out there. I was a, you know, religion major in college. And so I'm fascinated by this stuff. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, I'm going to, I'm going to try to like sum up the, this whole religion in a couple words. Um, religious religion major. Yeah. Major. Here we go on, on the record. Um, Messianic Jews are Jewish people who see their lineage, you know, coming 
through that whole tradition, but they do believe that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. But they don't believe that believing that makes them Christian. Is that fair yeah. to say? I think so, yeah. Or they just wouldn't use the word Christian, at least, you know. Uh, to most people, including most Jews, right? If you believe Jesus was the Messiah, you are a Christian. Whereas Messianic Jews are saying, no, we're Jewish. <laughs> basically saying Christianity or belief, you know, that Jesus was, is, whatever, the Messiah, you know, is fundamentally a Jewish religion. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the world, you know, and to use a, 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 a cancel culture term, that the world or the white world culturally appropriated um, Christianity from Jews mm -hmm. uh, would be an understatement, you know. Um, right. But that is what happened, and it snowballed into what we see now as Christianity. I know I've done a lot of quotes today, uh, but, <laughs> uh, you know, that's what we see now is this strange, um, you know, version of that religion that, that uh, was actually uh, a Jewish thing. And so, yeah, I think that Messianic Jews, and I don't want to speak for all Messianic Jews or uh, even my parents or anyone, you know, but it's my understanding because I haven't been within the religion for a good 30 years almost. So um, it's my understanding that they would see themselves as or see their lineage as first century Jews, you know, who accepted Jesus as the Messiah that has, was talked about all throughout the, the Jewish texts, you know, which was a small sect of Jews that said, okay, oh, this is it, this is it. Right. So they would see themselves as an extension of that. Mm -hmm. um, before it got to Constantine and... Before it got to Constantine and yeah. like that and turned into this state religion of, of Rome and, and, you know, all the other insane, terrible things that have happened in the name of Christianity, you know, um, which they, of course you know, any Messianic Jew would, would be, you know, aghast. I imagine it would be challenging to be raised Messianic Jew because it seems to me like, you know, Jews are one of the most marginalized or, or consistently sort of trodden upon people <laughs> is a nice way to put it. I, I don't know, like throughout yeah. history. Yeah. And Messianic Jews are people that are not only marginalized, from the world, but also from mainstream Judaism. That's right. I would say that's true. Yeah. But they do seem to have connections or there are bridges into, and this is in my opinion, and this is just my opinion. This is sort of the dark side of Messianic Judaism is there are these ties to the evangelical world. You know, and that's Tell me about that. That's where you get these ties to republicanism and stuff really has nothing to do with Jesus and what he would have said. But but somehow, you know, you have these seeped in. Yeah. It's, again, same thing where you have, you know, starting with, you know, Reagan or maybe before Reagan, you have this this like attempt to grab onto and control Christian people in the United States um, for votes and for power. Um, and so, you know, Messianic Judaism, I think to, lar to a large extent, and again, I've not been within it for like 30 years, so I, I'm, I may be speaking out of school, but I do think that there is a bit of a relationship to the evangelicals and therefore to republicanism and all the evils that that represents. Mm -hmm. Did it feel like you were growing up in like this tiny cult or did it feel like you were a part of this larger Jewish community or this larger Christian community? Uh, definitely. And, you know, they, they would not want to use the word cult, but yeah. definitely I grew up in a small religious community. Yeah. But that had ties nationwide and worldwide within the larger Messianic world, but, but certainly within that religious community. Yeah. I'm trying to take the word cult back. 
all religions started out as cults, man. Some more recently than others, you know. Right. When you start to look at religion and think about what it is, and you and when you start to look at recent religions, that's when you start to see the sort of like mystique unravels. Like even even looking back, and I'm not I don't want to diss anybody's religion, but like looking at Scientology and the roots of that, or looking at Mormonism and the roots of that, these are basically swindlers, you know, yeah. Joseph Smith, uh right. Uh, L. Ron Hubbard, you know, these are these are guys that, you know, you start to look at these people and you're like, OK, when, when you start to sort of think about where these things come from, you know, it, it can kind of I think it can get dark in a lot of cases. Oh, hell yeah, dude. And those like Scientology and Mormonism are two recent examples where we can see a recent history of how religions evolve, you know, personality to yeah. cult to you know, larger yeah. world to out in any religion. Yeah. Yeah. But I still think that there are deep truths to the human experience that religion taps into. Yeah. And all the religions sort of share these common traits, you know, because it's ultimately this like search inward for meaning, you know, and um, it's funny and kind of telling that a lot of the core principles of religions around the globe were very similar before there was worldwide communication. Right. That I find that very interesting. And and also that the core principles shifted in vaguely similar time periods. So you had Buddhism 500 years before Christianity and you could say there are some similar principles in there. You know, mm -hmm. the Buddhism, I don't even I don't even think of Buddhism as a religion exactly. Um, you know. Yeah. I mean it's more it's a life hack. <laughs> I if I'm if I have any religion, it, that would be the closest thing to the way that I like to think. Yeah, Buddhism. Yeah, yeah, me too. Not that I am Buddhist or anything, but it's like when I read those texts, it connects to me more than any of the others. Yeah, man. But yeah, music. You know, I like talking about religion with you, but people probably want to hear us talk about music. <laughs> Yes. Well, hey, here's a perfect segue. We started our own religion, right? Yeah. <laughs> Say that. I mean, I guess not really, but Church of Noise was a thing we started right at the top of the pandemic. At Joyful Noise, we started this nonprofit called Church of Noise. It actually is a 501c3 nonprofit. And my whole idea was to just let it be a vehicle to collect money and distribute it to artists who needed it primarily artists who could no longer tour and just a way to help artists to continue to make their work and not have to hang it up. And I asked you, Yoni, to be one of the elders of the church. So you're one of 10 people, including myself, who... Apostles, so to speak. Apostles, yeah. Every three months or so, we get together, all 10 of us, and we bring projects to the table and vote on where to distribute these funds. And it's, I'd say it's been a pretty positive thing. How do you feel about it? Definitely, man. Yeah. It's not, you know, it's, it's not like, it's not life changing money. We're doling out. Right. It's definitely like a little boost, you know, for someone that, that may need it. Um, and to keep them, keep them moving and, and keep them, making music, you know? Yeah, I think it's great. Yeah, it's usually $1,000 grants that we're doing. And we're usually doling out three or four of them per quarter. But so yeah. It's the kind of money that definitely can make a difference between getting a project done or not, right. you know, getting it out there or not. Right. Yeah, exactly. And that was one of my biggest fears when touring stopped. It was like, oh, fuck. I know so many artists that rely on touring as their like that's their day job. Yeah. They rely on this for their income. Whether or not they're doing it every day is a different thing, but they plan it out so that they can tour for four months of the year and have enough money for the whole year to pay their mortgage or their rent and then carry on, you know? Yeah. They don't rely on album royalty checks for that because just frankly they aren't enough in most cases yep and i was really scared when the pandemic happened that like we would just see this extinction of art a lot of forces are conspiring to i don't want to say extinguish art but to put art into the hands of very few that can actually afford you know in fact most i feel like most artists even indie artists you see coming out now 
are usually like rich kids, so to speak, because hmm. they have that safety net. You know, in case they fail at it, you know, they can rely on mommy and daddy or whatever. Right. Which is a really bad model. You know, like be, it takes a really insane person nowadays to be like, I'm going to do music full time and like I'm going to drop out of college or go. You know, I did that back in the day and was able to sustain myself. There wasn't much money back then either, but a little more than now, um, just in terms of, you know, album sales and value on on music and now you know where it's free all the time for everyone it's uh it really takes either someone that has that that wide safety net or a really insane person to be like i'm gonna do this you know right yeah it's sad to think about that but i think you're right i don't fully trust people with a safety net man like, if you've never had the threat of being homeless, if you've never had the possibility of getting evicted or of going hungry or whatever, it's like, you don't know the real value of shit. But, you know, you could say there there are, you know, there are levels and it, it is all mm. uh, relative. And, you know, and I, I don't know exactly your upbringing, but, you know, you grew up with a certain level of comfort. And so did I, you know, I maybe had to wear thrift store clothes or hand-me-downs. but you know, I, right, I, but, it, but we weren't like third world children or whatever. Yeah. I never really went without food. I never, you know, like, so there are levels. I don't know. I, I guess what I'm trying to say, I'm not trying to make like categorical statements about people because I'm sure there are plenty of like trust fund kids that have done amazing shit with that money. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But I will say that I learned a lot about the music business by touring around and sleeping on people's fucking floors you know and eating out of dumpsters <laughs> you know like that was a period of time though that's like that's like the period you came up in but like it doesn't have to be that way and i don't have necessarily i hear what you're saying you know and, and i don't necessarily have distrust for people who you know grew up with a safety net or have a safety net now so i, I don't necessarily look at that as a negative what i look at as a negative is that there are all those other artists out there that may really have something to say, but can't afford to throw caution to the wind and be like, I'm going to do music. They may be yeah. doing it in their spare time, but they got to go to college. They got to get a job that can pay their way. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's the more important point here. That's the more right. important point yeah. is that, you know, there may be artists we're missing out on, especially 10 years down the line. You know, if the Spotify's really win, you know, this, game then like you, you know you don't have independent music you have only music that's fed to you by from top down you know mm -hmm. yeah dude so all those trust fund kids have to start funding those other artists yeah that's one way to do it donate to church of noise <laughs> this whole thing has been in that <laughs> it's one big commercial <laughs> Or just give it to the fucking crazy artists in your town. When I started Church of Noise, I was thinking about people like Daniel Johnston. Right. You know, think about how fucking important his songs are. At least they are to me. And I think they have been to the wider music history at this point. In the streaming economy, I just can't imagine an artist like that. Right. Like a new version of Daniel Johnston ever getting off the ground, you know? Yeah, I, I, I hear you. But that's what we're sort of fighting against at the label. And at the same time, it's like a lot of people discover music through Spotify. So we're not we're not trying to like completely demonize new technologies. I have I have a membership to Spotify. It's yeah, incredibly too. convenient and, a, and an insanely wonderful technology. It's not about that. It's it's about it's more about. You know, their their algorithmic choices, like how that works and who they decide to put out there and um expose and what they pay and what they pay well, first and foremost mostly their payment structure yeah fucked yeah yeah I, I do think that you know not a luddite by any means and I, I i do think that this technology is incredible yeah it shouldn't be like tech dudes doing it like they yeah. should recognize the value of the art it should be thought of as like this is a 
valuable commodity. It's not free, you know, and they think of it as free and they're a tech company, not a music company. You know? Right. That's how they think of themselves. And I think that that is maybe the, the root of the, the problem. Yeah, that makes sense. But, you know, one great thing about it, dude, think about all the countries in the world that have never had record stores. Yeah, that, that's and the they, thing. Like, they it, all had now have smartphones and they have access to all the music in the history of the fucking world. That's powerful for human evolution. And I've seen this on these like digital reports that we receive where it's, you know, we'll see the money from Spotify coming in or whatever. And it'll be like, you know, top countries, US and then UK and then, you know, Canada, France, Germany, whatever. And then it's just like this endless stream of like countries that I've never even fucking heard of, you know. But then when you add up all those countries, like the amount that we got from those 50 to 100 different countries, it's like 20 percent of everything we got. And it's that's amazing. That is that's cool. incredible. Yeah, that we're able to spread our music that far into the world and get paid for it. That's cool. I, every once in a while, I'll get it. I'll get a, a social media follow from someone from like South Asia or like the pacific islands or africa and i'm like how did this person find me like but that's that's it yeah you're that's right probably it Meaning stuff man it's cool. yeah and so that's hugely positive so i don't think we have to break the model we just have to like fix their payment methods man yeah got to make it sustainable for artists does the government need to step in and like and bust it up or something or like i mean i think it deserves to be broken up and regulated but that's me anyway i know you got to go anything else you want to uh express uh just my gratitude for you and the label uh just being being so so uh down to to work with me and release stuff that i do and work oh, on man. um yeah i'm honored to work with you and uh and you know i'm honored to just uh have you as a good friend at this point man that's fucking that's wild like since my life is music, I don't really have friends outside of work, which is weird. You know what I mean? But it's I, I do know it to me because it's the same for me. Yeah. Yeah. But it's really nice to have real legitimate friendships in that space, you know. And I feel like we've got that. For sure. Definitely. Yeah. So thank you for that. Thank you. And thanks for having me on the uh the podcast, man. Yeah, but dude. Of course. I'll be on yours next time. You gotta, you gotta interview me. Get mine back up, back up and running. I'll get yeah, there. Let's yeah. do it. All right, dude. Well, have a good evening, man. Thanks so much for taking the time. You, too, man. See Peace. you, bud. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Joyful Noise Radio Hour. <laughs>